Strangest of all was serial fraudster Giovanni Di Stefano, who took on not one, but two of TVNZ's finest. Why, you think I'm scared of you? By the time this airport pursuit video was aired on New Zealand television in 1990, most Kiwis had a fair idea by then of what the Italian with the pommy accent, Giovanni Di Stefano, was all about. Besides the fact he punched like a girl. Put it nicely, in future, no Kiwi would be taking a cheque from him. Di Stefano's New Zealand escapades began only a few weeks prior when he came off a flight from Los Angeles into Auckland with his Kiwi bride Tanya by his side. It was May of 1990 when the bespeckled Di Stefano claimed to be on a hundred million dollar New Zealand property buying spree all on behalf of his Beverly Hills investors. Small change for a businessman who at the time was making a highly publicised multi-billion dollar attempt to buy the film studio's MGM. In a whirlwind week or so, deals totally 60 million were signed on eight properties, including Parnell's Royal Oak Mall. All he needed to do now is quickly shoot back to LA to sort the dosh out. No worries. He would be back in two shakes of a lamb's tail to close those deals and spend another $40 million at his disposal. Pakatau Island was top of his wants list. Right from the start, questions were being raised about the flamboyant Italian. Not at least those. Were the concerns held by the country's then leading broadcaster, Paul Holmes. To paraphrase Holmes' appraisal of Giovanni Di Stefano, those clothes aren't even his own. The blood was in the water. Back stateside, MGM labelled his claims of a takeover as the stuff of Alice in Wonderland and proceeded to sue him. Alerted to the scope of his business dealings, official didn't in the form of the Serious Fraud Office, also had their suspicions. It didn't take much scratching of the surface from them to discover Giovanni had history in massive inverted commas. There was a six-month sentence in Ireland in 1975. A year later he swapped a jail cell in Ireland for one in England where he did three years for obtaining property by deception. Oh yeah, there was that small matter of the $75 million fraud conviction in 1986 as well. One of nature's fraudsters. A swindler without scruple or conscience. is how a British judge at the Old Bailey trial described him, while sending him down for another five years. Giovanni professed his innocence to the New Zealand police and the New Zealand press. Claiming all these cases was simply a case of mistaken identity. Fingering a fictitious cousin he named as John Di Stefano. Fingerprinting by the New Zealand police proved otherwise. And since Giovanni had failed to disclose his numerous convictions to immigration officials, he was subsequently refused re-entry. Meaning when Di Stefano and Tanya from Kaurau turned back up in Auckland, they were put on the same flight back to LA, hotly pursued by television New Zealand journalists who caught up with them at Honolulu Airport. That was the TV New Zealand video you saw on the intro. Seriously, people, you could do a five-hour YouTube on the chap and only cover a fraction of his colourful exploits. The only issue one has with Giovanni Di Stefano is deciphering what is real and what is mere fantasy he dreamt up. Those two are blurred to a point they are virtually 
one and the same. To get a scope of his historic exploits and grandiose claims, let's do a quick true or crap 10 question quiz. Let the fun begin. Easy first question. Was Giovanni Di Stefano on the legal team at the Iraqi dictator's trial? For a big clue to the correct answer, there's a little bit of a giveaway in the title of this video. Yes, that is actually true. That story alone could occupy a whole video itself. Di Stefano once hung around with Robert Mugabe. Crap or true? Nah, crap, no evidence. Number three. Despite holding no legal qualifications, he represented Britain's largest mass murderer, Dr. Harold Shipman. Nah, another crap claim, vehemently denied by his real lawyers. Was he the legal representative for Gary Glitter? Crap, crap, crabbly crap. Five in the list. What about Ronald Biggs? He was on his legal case, right? True, he really was. See how confusing it gets when facts meet fiction? Di Stefano once met the world's most notorious terrorist. Nah, he made that claim up too. He attempted to get Charles Manson's life sentence commuted. True, he did partition President Obama. Number eight, see how much fun we're having? Next up, Charlie. Did Stefano once try and get Britain's most violent prisoner, the notorious Charles Bronson, released? No, that's crap. He made it up. Second to last question to ponder. Did Di Stefano posthumously attempt to get Dr. Crippen pardoned? Yes, we are talking the murderer from 1910, Dr. Crippen. Yep, only he could dream that one up. Last one, troops. Di Stefano was once a director of Scottish football club Dundee. True. This happened in 2003, at which time his Kiwi wife Tanya was also listed as a company director. What happened to her thereafter is anyone's guess. In 2003 he similarly tried to force his way onto the board of Norwich City. Bemused and confused by now? You should be. Still, let's go deeper down the rabbit hole. The year is 2011, when Di Stefano claimed Osama bin Laden was getting a bad rap. Osama bin Laden is not really guilty of anything. Uh, and of course, at the end of the day, they have to concede that at the very best, he was inspirational uh, to committing acts of terrorism against the United States. That has yet to be tested, frankly. There's very, very little evidence of that, uh, too. Of course, I met him in 1998 when he was a nothing and a nobody, when, he, when it wasn't important. So where is Giovanni Di Stefano today? As at the production of this video, 
you can visit him here. Yep, the fake lawyer, serial fraudster, is back in the slammer. Maintains his 14-year sentence was politically motivated and that he is currently unlawfully detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. They're all out to get him. His latest utterances from behind bars include a claim his father was murdered by British spies in Italy using an ice pick. One surmises Trotsky's biography is therefore in the prison library. In summary, it seems fitting we end this all by taking a look at the next YouTube video De Stefano issued just before his latest stretch. Take a deep breath and strap yourself in. If you thought it couldn't get any weirder, think again. Because of the evil things, wicked things, mendacious things that certain people are doing to me, and those people know who they are. Through the old traditions of our family, I reverse the curse and use the words handed down for over seven generations. Tre occhio, tre ucchiata, tre sante che mi hanno aiutata, padre, figlio e spirito santo. The curse that she tried to put on me is now on its way back, but even worse, in my family's generation, one object has been handed down from generation to generation. It's something that I didn't want to use, I thought I would never use, wanted never to use. But because certain people are evil beyond even any comprehension, they apply hate, vendetta, lies. They do everything possible to try and harm someone. I'm forced. It's called the raven and owl curse. It homes in on the victim as if it's directed by radar, causes them discomfort, self-loathing and self-destruction. It lowers their emotional and physical resistance to illnesses, causes them sadness regret and eventually despair. It neutralizes their power and their inner resolve to cause harm to others. Those people who have tried to cause me harm and you know who you are, a serving police officer, a would-be wannabe predator, so-called singer-actress, an ipsissimus, an IT person, those people who have lied, schemed and simply been incapable of any kind of truth or humanity. The raven and the owl curse is now flying in your direction. And like a fatwa, it cannot be removed, not even by me. It's on its way to you.